You guys, yep. you guys can hear me okay, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yes, I, I have a lovely voice, I've been told, but only by my mother, so I'll have to assume that. Uh, that's it. All right, so uh, this shouldn't be a really long presentation, but hopefully uh, worthwhile. The, um, we want to talk about, obviously, there's been a lot of changes in workforce, a lot of things going on. Um, it really just kind of showing what we've seen uh, in the workplace, what we've seen changing and evolving, and uh, also some of the risks associated with that. So with that, I'll uh, share my screen and uh, get going here. Um, so can everybody see what's on my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, great, excellent. Okay, so first off, this is a uh, brand new webinar for us. So obviously things are constantly changing. So uh, you may have to be a little gentle uh, during the presentation. There might be a couple of things that change here and there. Um, but uh, essentially it's a very dynamic uh, quick note about us. So Bravery Technology, so we do IT support. We handle all of Eastern Massachusetts, Rhode Island. Uh, we have been around for uh, over 30 years now. And we uh, basically, our goal is to make everything amazing. Uh, so the only thing you have to do is remember your passwords. Uh, we take care of uh, all, you know, pretty much all of your IT needs uh, for anybody who's uh, any size client, um, whether they have uh, no IT in house or have an existing IT, uh, we support and help them along. Enough about me. Uh, marketing department put a picture of Tom Cruise on here instead of me. I apologize for that. We'll get that updated. All right, so uh, what we're gonna talk about is one, just how things are working now, what you guys should be able to do right now, what you should be in the process of going through and how you should be set up. Then the next thing we're gonna talk about is what new challenges, what security issues we're seeing and what solutions that have been going through. And the last step is uh, what's next, getting back. As Christine said, the um, uh, next Monday we might be back in the office. Uh, so what, what do we need to do to start preparing our workforce for that? All right. Okay. So first off is, uh, I have on the slide is why, are, why are we, how are we so lucky? So what does that mean? So that means basically, um, we're at an interesting point in technology where if this uh, same incident had happened 10, 15 years ago, maybe even sometimes five years ago, we wouldn't be nearly as prepared as we are now. So with this in place, we actually are able to do a lot more remotely than we were, again, even 10 or 15 years ago. Systems are uh, much more robust. They uh, accommodate working remotely. We're actually a little more prepared than most, most other parts of the country. Um, so we have colleagues across the country that talk to on a regular basis, and it's very interesting how the majority of our clients were actually already set up to work remotely and they were already testing it and working. Whereas when you get into sites that are like Alabama or um, Missouri or Kansas or wherever it may be, they don't have blizzards, they don't have hurricanes, they don't have those kind of preparations that they have to make to say, okay, how do we make sure people are working? If we get a blizzard in and we're, and we're snowed in for three or four or five days, how do we, how do, we do that? we're already ahead of the ball where a lot of the workforce up here was actually already set to work remotely, which is great. Down there, they were just getting swamped uh, when they couldn't go to work. So we're actually kind of lucky in the day and age that we are, that we actually are able to work. So part of this presentation we're gonna go through is it's gonna touch a little bit on our cybersecurity presentation, which is a much longer and different presentation. But I'm gonna go through some of the relevant parts of it. Uh, the main thing we wanna talk about is right up here, our remote users. So first thing uh, to know is that the, again, we're able to work remotely, which is great. Um, you can use log me in, go to my PC. There's a whole bunch of tools out there. Uh, one of the main ones that a lot of our clients that we have using is actually what's called a remote SSL. What a remote SSL does actually gives them a remote access into their network where they can actually get into the network cleanly. If they have a PC in the office, they can literally take over that PC and it's great. And it tends to work a little better. It's a little robust. And the best part is that for most users, that solution is actually free. So um, if you're not using a solution like that, you may want to contact your IT provider to see if that is an option available to you that, hey, can I get an SSL license and can I get in for free and kind of tie into my computer? Um, it's nice, it's fast, it's quick, and it's something that would be robust. And again, you don't have to pay that monthly fee. So let's say all summer long you don't need it, you won't have to pay for it. 
which is kind of a key thing. Um, uh, so the uh, next part to talk about is phone systems. Uh, so the many of our clients are on our hosted VoIP system. So what what benefits do a hosted VoIP system have? So basically, one of the key ones that you can literally take your phone off your desk and bring it right home, and it functions just like it does at uh, at the office. There's also a mobile app that you can put on there, so you can take calls even when you're on the road. So what we're finding a lot is that when we're taking on new clients, the you call into the main office, you try and get transferred over to the decision maker. They're like, okay, well they're working from home now. Okay, well can you transfer me over? No, they're on their cell phone. I can't transfer you to the cell phone. Now the owners and the workers are now working on their cell phones. Now what's happening is they're making calls out. They're making calls out from their cell phone. So now they're giving out their cell phone number, and it makes for a very decentralized of communication so by it being able to centralize the voice and have it work just as seamlessly when you're out of the office as when you're in the office it's kind of key for the communication part of it they also most of the most of them out there or most of the better options out there allows you even just use a web browser when you're on the road so let's say you're traveling somewhere you only have your notebook you can make a call um, but also when a call comes in because it's hosted, it's not reliant on your system, it's not reliant on your internet connection, it's not reliant on anything. So basically, you're not going to miss a call. It's always going to go at least to some kind of automated tenant kind of voicemail. A lot of them have the ability to transcribe the message into an actual text message so that you not only get an email with your voicemail attached as a, as a WAV file, but actually transcribes it out. So you literally don't even have to listen to the voicemail message anymore. And you could forward that email around. And a lot of times, most of the time, there's also a cost savings on it. So again, the hosted VoIP is really suits itself really well for this type of environment and what you're trying to do um, in this more distributed work environment. Uh, next that everybody's uh, been really heavily utilizing, just like we're on Zoom right now, um, is the video conferencing tools. So there's a lot of video conferencing tools out there. And of course, what we're finding out is that there's a lot of security issues. I'll type it, touch into those in a, in a little bit. Um, so you have typical ones of Zoom, GoToMeeting, Microsoft Teams. One that you might not have heard of is Uber Conference, which uh, works really well. These are all really, really good, uh, good solutions. They work really well. They allow us to do a lot of things and kind of work in a collaborative effort. Um, one of the questions that we tend to get, uh, because Microsoft's doing a great job marketing Teams right now, and there's a lot of a lot of commercials on Teams. Um, one of the typical questions we'll get is, when when would I use Teams and when would I use Zoom, and you know, are they the same thing? So, uh, real summary. So you got Zoom, GoToMeeting, Uber Conference. Those are all great for what we're doing right here. Webinars, um, conferences, everything like that. They work tremendous for that because that's their main focus on what they do. Teams will also do um, on-demand conferencing. It's not very robust when it comes to webinars, so I wouldn't use Teams for a webinar. But Teams is also a much more robust package as far as collaboration. So if you wanted to have like uh, on top of being able to collaborate in a video, you can also have a chat feature. You can share files. You can have project teams. You can have chat channels. You can have all sorts of things. Uh, we do separate webinars just on using Teams and how to use Teams, um, and we publish those on a, we present those on a regular basis. But it's a much more robust platform. It may be more than what you need if you simply just need to do a you know quick meeting with a whole bunch of colleagues, and that's all you're ever going to do. Teams might be more than what you need for that. But if you're going to do a lot more collaborating and a lot more group effort, which uh, our industry has tended to start to move towards, that's where Teams really is very powerful and what you can do and really collaborate and work together. So um, all of those products are good products. They all serve a, a distinct purpose and they all work really well together. Um, one of the things I'll say, uh, so in this meeting, there's gonna be some times where you may want to uh, take some notes and write some things down. So this will be one of those, uh, one of those times. So make sure you have a pen and paper ready if you don't. Uh, so one of the things that, one of the new challenges that have come up while people are working remotely is um, remote access or remote work policies in place. So basically what, uh, what are the company guidelines while you're working remotely? Uh, what should you be doing? What sh who should you talk to? How should you talk to them? So what we've done is we've started, we put together a template um, that you can get and customize for yourself. Uh, for your own company and distribute out now that you have your workforce distributed, it's important to have a 
policy in place. So basically, if you just, um, uh, we have our contact page up there. If you go into our contact us page, send a note in there saying, hey, I'd like to get the remote access policy. We'll send that right out to you, it's no charge. Um, and you can go through and it's a template. You can literally put in your own company name, you can put in your own policies, put in your own structure, uh, customize it the way you want to, but at least gives you a basis to go on and something to put into the employee manual when people are coming on and coming into play. Um, there's obviously a lot of access policies that you should have in company in, in your place, a lot of like mobile phone policy, computer use policy, internet use policy. This is one for remote access policy. If you guys need help with those other policies and so forth, we can uh, help and send you templates for those as well. All right. So next I wanna go through and start talking about um, the security. So basically what, what issues are we seeing now that we weren't seeing before? Um, I'm gonna to touch a little bit on, like I said, our cybersecurity presentation that we do. I'm gonna do just a small section of it um, as well. So you can see what, what we're dealing with. So the number one thing to do is kind of like know your enemy, if you will. Um, key thing that most people, a lot of people don't realize is that being a hacker or whatever you want to call them, any kind of deviant uh, out there, it's actually now a full-time job. There are literally companies that hire work and have office buildings, have office hours. And literally what they're doing is hiring people to get into your network, to get into your data and get into your um, uh, confidential uh, information to try and go after your client base. So the, um, the key thing is to know that it's not just like, like the old days where it's just like some kid, you know, some, uh, doing a, doing a game or anything like that. This is literally how they make their money and how they make their business trying to get you to trip up. So we need to have the safeguards in place. Uh, it's not something that is, uh, you know, you have to worry about just for the little guys. It's basically, it happens to everybody. Um, all the major companies uh, are vulnerable to get attacked, and unfortunately, a lot of them have been attacked to some form. Um, and they're all major companies that have major data that we're worried about. So obviously, these ones that I have going up on the screen here are all major corporations. Google actually had such an issue with their version of um, Facebook that they actually just shut it down. It was actually such a security hole and they were so worried about it that they actually shut the whole thing down altogether. Um, a lot of people don't realize how much uh, Facebook has been breached and that's a big problem and I'll, I'll tell you why it's been, uh, it's a big problem that, uh, that causes other issues as well. Um, the, uh, but they get targeted, even Target, if you guys remember Target, uh, retail chain got hacked last year. Um, most people don't realize that the way Target got hacked is actually through their HVAC system. So their HVAC vendor set up a Wi-Fi connection that was insecure. Target didn't realize it. Some hacker went in through the HVAC system and got into Target's own system through their, through their own HVAC. Um, so this is a uh, snapshot of the data breaches that are kept to date uh, on a, that are updated on a regular basis. This is like a pretty graph, but it gets real time. So you can see, Facebook has 420 million uh, accounts that have been breached, but you can see Capital One is in there. Um, there's some other company, Microsoft, uh, Quest Diagnostics, so that's security, that's health information. This happens on a regular basis. These are the ones that are announced, but they're not like highly publicized in the news. So why do we, why do we care about any of this? Um, so what we care about is basically um, what you're looking for or worried against is uh, what's called social engineering. Um, so what social engineering does is basically takes the data and manipulates it and tries to um, expose you to weaknesses. So here's a, I'll give a very generic, for instance. So um, there's a new, let's say there's a new construction going up and in that new construction, they're hiring a contractor. Um, to do plumbing, electrical, HVAC, whatever it may be. So let's call the building, uh, building one, two, three, right? So building one, two, three is going up. It's a big building, so it's in the news and everybody's, uh, everybody sees it in the news. So, but also there's some hacker overseas who's literally watching local news and stuff like that. So what they're doing is they see that building going up 
And then they start, so they call up the building and they're like, hey, yeah, um, I see you have a new building going up. It's great. We're a, uh, we're a general contractor. We do plumbing. Um, and we'd love to be able to bid on this building. And the building owner says, no, we've already got a general contractor for the plumbing. Thank you very, thank you very much. And they say, oh, that's great. Oh, who are you using? And they say, oh, well, we're using uh, Bob's, uh, Bob's Plumbing to put that, uh, that contractor in. And he's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, great. Uh, they're a great company. They work really good. Thank you very much. They hang up. So then they call up Bob's company, Bob's plumbing company. They say, yeah, 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 we're with building XYZ. And thank you very much. You guys are doing a great job. We're just checking on the different phases. We're just trying to see, you know, what phase are you on? When do you think that phase will be done? And they say, okay, yeah. And then, hey, we need to have a check ready for you. How much is that check going to be for? Oh, that project phase is going to be, you know, $1,200,000 on the next phase. Okay, great. That's all we need to know. Thank you very much. That same person calls back up to building XYZ closer to that date. Let's say it's going to be June 6th that the next schedule is done. June 6th, they call up and they say, hey, yeah, this is Bob's Plumbing. Uh, we're just about done with this phase. And the phase included this, this, and this, and this. And our bill is $1.2 And when you're ready, we'd love you to send us the payment. Here's the wire information to send that over. And of course, they're wiring it to the wrong thing. Um, unfortunately, that literally happens, and that's what happened to the town of, uh, in Colorado, who actually paid $1 million to a bridge that didn't, that, that, uh, didn't wasn't actually done. Um, so it does happen. So how does that relate to like, uh, a data breach in like Facebook? So how that relates to the data breach in Facebook is that most of your employees probably have a Facebook account. A couple of things they have with that Facebook account, they have a username and a password. So if Facebook is breached with a username and password, there's a couple of things that we're worried about. Number one, people, uh, human beings tend to use something similar. And when they get to their password, they tend to use a similar password. Maybe it's their cat's name. Maybe it's their dog's name. Maybe it's their kid's name. Maybe it's their mother's name, whatever it may be. They're going to use some kind of similar basis. And then they're going to use some kind of date. It'll be like their birth date, anniversary date, anything like that. So there's a couple of things that are, that are a problem. Once you have the username and password for the Facebook, then there's a chance that those people are using a similar version of that password for their business account. Guess what's in their Facebook? It's where they work for a business. So now I know when they're going into the business, if I know that they're working for XYZ Bank, well, all right, the username that that person has for XYZ Bank is probably their first initial, last name. First name, last initial first name, last name, something like that. So I have their username. I have the basis of what their password probably is because it's similar to their Facebook password. So now I have a base to go on and start hacking off of. Um, so we're concerned. So you want to be concerned about that, but then also just from a user standpoint, standpoint in Facebook, once I know your username and uh, password for Facebook, I can then start figuring out who your bank is. So you might use Chase Bank, Bank of America, whatever. I'll, I'll try them all. I don't really care. But then also your Best Buy account, uh, whatever it may be. And I'm going to start using, again, that same username and password if I can to see if those work. If not, I know they're going to be a base off that same thing. Then on top of that, let's say I go into Chase and Chase says, no, no, you forgot your password. You need to, you need to reset it. All right, I'll reset my password. Well, it's going to ask me security questions. Security questions are, you know, what's your maiden name? What's your pet's name? What street did you grow up on? Who was your first grade teacher? All those things, right? Guess what exists in Facebook? All of that information that I need to get into your account. Real, really easy for me to get into and, and find that out. So um, that's why those type of breaches are actually very crucial. And what we're looking for on a business standpoint is we want those passwords in the business to rotate on a regular basis. We want them to all be unique and be forced to be unique. So they can't use them as a basis. All right, next thing is that companies, most companies, especially bigger companies, they do wire transfers. So uh, what we're worried about on the wire transfer is now you have a combination of social engineering and wire transfer. And I gave you a scenario of that in the construction example that I gave. But basically what we're worried about is people are going to start then saying, okay, Oh, thank you very much. We did a good job. Now can you just wire the um, wire the payment for that job over to this account? Because they're going to very easily go through in social engineering and say, okay, what do we have um, going through? So uh, now some of you may have already known or may not known, but basically, again, this is not something I'm making up. This is something that happened in real life. So one of the Shark Tank stars is exactly what happens. Their office was socially engineered 
and they wired $400,000 to an offshore account because they thought they were paying an invoice for a vendor. They weren't. They were socially engineered and um, tricked into paying uh, that wire transfer. They'll never get that money back. The money went to the wire transfer, immediately got transferred over to Bitcoins, and it's gone forever. So you need to work with your bank to make sure that you have security precautions set up for your wire transfers, that you have multiple people that have to sign off on it, that basically there's a system in place and a uh, policy in place for wire transfers. Mm. Okay. Other thing to look for is uh, phishing emails. I'm not gonna go through a whole litany of them. Like I said, in our cybersecurity presentation, we go through a lot more of these, but basically what we're looking for is typical key things on, um, on, uh, on these. But what we're finding now is now that people are disjointed and away from the office, they're not talking to each other as much. So what happens is they're emailing, communicating electronically more and relying on that more than they were before. What that means is that if I'm a hacker, it's a lot easier for me because I can emulate you electronically. I can't emulate you as a person. I can't emulate you on the phone, but I can emulate you electronically. So it's very easy for somebody to send an email message and pretend who they are and what they're doing um, because you're not questioning as much. And the emails are going a little faster and furious going through. So your, your company needs to be on a higher alert for phishing scams and email scams. Now, I mentioned a lot about, okay, working with this contractor or working with this, you know, this employee or going through and all the social engineering. Um, it might seem like it's not always that easy to do, but believe it or not, it actually, it's actually not that difficult for most of, most of the people uh, who are watching this webinar, most of you have a website. And most of you on your website, what you have is pretty much everything I need to socially engineer you. Um, I know I can go to your about us page and I can find out who your founder is. I can usually find out who, who works in what department I can find out the C level. I can sometimes find out your entire company staff, uh, right there. But then I can also find out really quick. You're going to be really proud of who your clients are. You're trying to use your clients to sell to more clients. So you're saying, Hey, look, we work for GE. We work for general dynamics. We work for Bob's towing. We work for whatever it may be. I now have your client base. So now I can start contacting your client base and pretending I'm you and pretending to send them false bills and false work orders. Same thing with your vendors. You, a lot of times you have your vendors on your list. Well, guess what? You pay your vendors and you have to pay your vendors. Now, now I know who I need to impersonate when I call you and look for you to pay me uh, falsely. There's no happy medium on that because your marketing team is going to want all of that information up on your website. I don't blame them. Um, but at the same time, really need to be diligent on the social engineering side to know that that information is out there and easily attainable. Um, and that can be unfortunately used just as easily against you. Again, if you go back to the first slide I have, there's hackers who were paid just to learn this information and learn about you. And you might think that you're too small. You might think that you're too big. It's not the case. Every client gets hit to some extent because they all have some kind of data that's worth some kind of value to them. All right. Um, okay. Uh, next thing I'll go over is the, uh, so one of the things that we do on a regular basis, there's another one that you might want to write this down. Uh, you can contact us. We'll get you on this, uh, on the tip campaign. We send out weekly security tips. Um, and what this thing is, uh, these are basically security uh, tips that we're coming up with a, on, a, on a regular basis saying, okay, Make sure you're doing this. Make sure you're doing that. This is what we came across recently. This is what we've uh, found. Um, this is an alert item. Uh, we've also have some that we're sending out right now that are very COVID-19 specific. So with everybody working remotely, hence the reason for this webinar, there's more specific uh, security tips that we're sending out. Hopefully, we can um, go back to just normal security tips uh, in a little bit. But basically, um, if you want to get on the on those weekly security tips, so you get them that just come in your in your mailbox, you can read them really quick. They're not really long, um, and just sign up. We'd be happy to send them send them over to you. Okay. Um, any questions on what I have so far? I can't see any chat session or anything like that, so I'll, uh, I'll assume there isn't. Okay. So what are some of the things that are some of the other newer items that we have going through? So one of the things that's happening now is what we're noticing is that people are working at different times to accommodate not being able to go to the office. 
one of the big things that we're seeing is that um, because people, it, it's not necessarily them that's the issue, but also their, but their families. You have fam other family members at home. You have kids that may be home uh, and homeschooled. So what's happening is the work day is now changing and is expanding. Now, what we did at our office back in the early April uh, when this first happened, or actually uh, late March, I should say, we actually expanded our normal business hours. So we expanded our normal business hours, our normal calling hours to accommodate that extra work environment. But the hackers know that you're working all sorts of hours. So what they're actually doing is they're actually smart enough, they're actually trying to go after you on those off hours, knowing that you may not have somebody like us to call when, you ha when something suspicious pops up. And you may have to try and battle it yourself. So they're actually preying on that and looking at those off hours. They're very fun. Um, so they're saying, okay, well, where normally I would go in at 7 a.m. and there wouldn't be anybody to attack, I have somebody to attack at 7 a.m. now. Um, and so they're actually utilizing that. And what they're looking at is not, they're looking at it as a, a longer opportunity. It's more like their business hours have opened up and they're more available and more opportunity for them, for people to go after. Um, so not great. Um, next thing you want to make sure of is um, start, if you haven't already, start setting up two-factor authentication on everything you can set up two-factor authentication on. Um, you're, if you're on some version of Office 365, you should have two-factor authentication set up right away. It's free. It's easy. Most of your applications are going to have two-factor authentication set up. Um, um, oh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, Kenny, but what kind of two-factor um, can you tell me a little bit more about what the two-factor is again? Oh, sure, yeah. So I'm sorry, that, that's a great question. So what two-factor means is that when you log into an application or a system, your phone, maybe your phone uh, will get a text message or you might have an application on your phone that you have to then log in and set, set a second code um, to go in. Like a, a common one would be like, an, uh, so for Office 365, what would happen is you go to log into Office 365, you put in your username and your password, it sends you a text message with a six digit code. And you have to type in that six digit code. So what, so that's very similar with like certain applications will have different, um, different programs on them as well. So I'll show the, um, so this is one that we use uh, called Auth Anvil. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, so we use that for some of our applications as well. Um, so basically just having the username and the password isn't enough anymore. The hacker now needs that that third form of ID. So you might use it for your LinkedIn account. You might use it for your Yahoo email, um, for your Office 365 email, for your SSL VPN, um, if you're doing log me in. All of those tools that you have or your, your, your standard in-office application, um, if they don't have two-factor authentication, reach out to the vendor and say, hey, we really want two-factor authentication, especially anything that is financial in nature. You want it to have two-factor authentication. Um, your banks will probably, uh, should already have some kind of form of two-factor authentication as well. Uh, so basically that's going to prevent, so, uh, a very, uh, so one of the, one of the phishing emails, uh, um, that we, we show you in a presentation and one of those very common is actually ways of people trying to get your username and password for your email account. And then what they do, once they get your username and password for your email account, Back in the old days, all they would do is just send a whole bunch of viruses to all your friends and family and say, oh yeah, hope it works. Now, they will literally sit and watch your email account and they'll actually watch it and see what's going on. And they're going to monitor and then they're going to set up a forwarder. So they're gonna automatically forward all of your emails off to them. And then heaven forbid you're an admin, they're actually going to log into, your ad, uh, into other users' email boxes and do the same thing. And they're gonna keep watching. And what are they gonna watch for? They're gonna watch for a couple of key events. They're gonna watch for you to go on vacation. So when you go on vacation, then that's when they're actually gonna go in and log in as you and actually start, start sending emails out. They might send an email out to your payroll person saying, hey, I just changed payroll providers. Can you, can you change my uh, bank account? Here's my new bank account for you to send my payroll to. They might send emails out to your, cli uh, to your client saying, hey, yeah, thank you very much for this job. The job's, not, um, job's all set. We have a different payment place for you to send payments for the job when it's done. Here it is. Um, they have, uh, they, they basically are going to monitor all of those emails going through and they're going to actually have a human being actually figure out how can we take that information and manipulate it for our benefit. And they're amazing at it. And they'll sit and wait for months on end. You'll never know that they're there until they actually act and pounce on it. Does that explain 
that a good explanation? Yes. No. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I'll assume it is. Okay. No, sorry. My my touchpad. It's a new computer, so like every time I go to click something, it clicks the wrong thing. So I have like the chubby oh. little fingers. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> sorry. No, that's okay. All right. So next issue that we're having that's uh, that's more robust. So basically. When your workers work, work remotely, they should have their own computer from, that's issued from the company. That could be patched, monitored, maintained, everything like that. Um, however, in this day and age, um, the, that's not happening as much because when this whole thing happened, there was a shortage of computers. People had to use what was available at home um, and the companies had to let them use what's available at home. That's it's all, the only option you have. So now what we ran into is now there's a whole bunch of computers that are accessing the company network that are not protected or authorized by the company. So they don't have AV protection. The AV protection that they have might have been expired three years ago. It came free with the computer, nobody updated it. May not have malware detection, may not have any security patches updated, might have not have any updates at all. So it's not being monitored malicious. And once these computers are on, they're now on your network. So now what's on their computer is now on your network. So now whatever exposure they have is, is uh, one that the company has to be concerned with. So some other things that they, um, some precautions you wanna make sure your, computer, your home users have is make sure that they have a screensaver set up that has a password timeout. Again, if you're in the office, we're, we uh, will typically push that down to the users through uh, what's called the group policy and force the screens to go into password saving mode. But you don't have that control over their home computers. So you have to rely on them to do that. You wanna make sure they lock the computers when they walk away. Again, they're logged into your network. Their computer's sitting on their kitchen table or on their um, uh, on a tray table or in the living room, wherever it may be. There's other people walking around there. It may be your kids, might be your um, spouse. It could be anybody. They're now on your, on your computer. The other thing that you have is you have confidential calls and material. So again, now when you're talking, your users at their home if they're an HR person, they're on the phone and they're talking about something HR related, their spouse is in the other room because he or she is working remotely as well. You have kind of a confidential issue because unwittingly that spouse is, has the potential to hear the confidential call of somebody's HR issue, which now you're, now you have to worry about um, personal health information. Um, and same thing with the kids, like you, you know, depending on the age of the kids. So we have issues along that line that have to be, um, have to work around. I don't think everybody has a sound booth at their house yet. Um, so password managers, again, at home computers, people don't change the passwords and we don't have any way to force them to change the passwords. So you need to make sure that they review their passwords, that it's not the same as their Facebook password or their, some other password they're using. You need, you need them to be, use a strong password that's complex um, keep in mind that a long password is more powerful than a short password with random characters in it. So if you have a password that says, my dog likes to eat brown food, that is much more secure than some random character that's only six characters long um, from a brute force attack. Um, password managers help with this, keeping track of multiple passwords that allows you to generate uh, random passwords and keep track of them. Uh, something like a LastPass works for that. Um, and try not to storm in your web browser because web browsers, uh, there's tools that can attack web browsers as well. Next thing we're worried about is um, storing files locally. So what we're seeing as well is that people working home, they're actually taking the files off of their office computer and bringing them home and working them on their home computer. Uh, what's happening with that is that there's no way for those uh, files to be backed up. So they're sitting on that home computer, their update, you have a user that's putting hours and hours and hours of work into those files, they're not backed up at all. So if they lost, you've lost all that productivity. Um, what you could also run into is you have one person updating a file on their home computer, somebody else updating a file on their home computer, and they're out of sync. And so now you can't merge those two together. Um, last thing is anything happens to their home computer, if they get compromised in any way, now those local files, those company files are now exposed out to the internet. So now everybody's worried about, uh, everybody's got access to what's on that home computer, which may be um, office files. Um, same thing if somebody uses a thumb drive, that could be a problem as well. So if that thumb drive gets lost or stolen or anything like that, obviously now you may have to report that um, as a data breach. 
you don't want to report it as a data breach. Um, file sharing software. So another thing that's become uh, popular is people using Dropbox, but unfortunately Dropbox is not, uh, not very secure in the sense of uh, enterprise level. Um, so, and they've had their, they've had their data breaches as well. Um, so we worry about uh, information being on these file sharing storages that are not secure um, and not well protected. Um, and then sure enough, just in time for this presentation, um, Citrix ShareFile, which is one of the more, typically one of the more stringent ones and one of the better enterprise ones, they had a data breach um, just this last week. And so uh, now they have to go through and put a whole bunch of patches in place and everything. And this is one of the ones that are you know, supposed to be one of the more secure ones out there, and one of the better ones out there. And obviously Citrix is a big company. So um, we now have to worry about those files and those remote online sharing and what could possibly be happening with those. Next thing uh, that we now have to worry about is since the computer's on your home network, now we have to start worrying about other devices that are on your home network. What are those devices doing? What information are they grabbing? What information are they taking, are they taking from you? Um, so there's an endless array of, of data that's on your network that now we have, to, we have to concern, okay, what is that Xbox? We know that it's going around and doing, um, talking to the rest of the computers on the network. That's what the Xbox does, what the PlayStation does, what the TV does, all of them. Um, what do they get? What information are they gathering? What are they getting into? What do we have to worry about on there? Um, Next, along that same line is the Wi-Fi. So your computer at home is probably a notebook or something like that. So you're probably using Wi-Fi. So now we have to worry about what other devices are on that Wi-Fi. What other people came to your house that borrowed your Wi-Fi password? What are your kids' you know, iPhones on Wi-Fi? Their iPads on your Wi-Fi? Again, your company computer is now on, your company data is now on your user's home network. You're now exposed to whatever they have um, on there. And most of the home users don't have a true firewall. They just have that free router that was, came to them from Fios or Comcast, something like that, which means they have very little protection into that home computer as well. Uh, and the other thing that we're worried about is the um, internet streaming. So obviously to do what you need to do remotely, you need internet bandwidth and internet availability. So obviously as kids are staying home, they're streaming things all day long to keep themselves uh, entertained or you're doing it to keep them entertained. Um, so now that bandwidth is now affecting the user's productivity. So now basically if they can't do what they need to do because somebody's streaming uh, Spotify or Netflix movie or whatever it may be, um, you know, Disney sing along too, um, then basically now it's affecting the home users that way. All right, we do have, uh, we have another free report that you can sign up for. Uh, which is the uh, top 10 ways that hackers get around your firewall. You can see the address uh, right up on your screen there. Uh, if you type that in, we'll send you a free report on what you want your network, uh, what things you want to look for in your network and which ways you want to protect it. Uh, so basically the, um, what we're looking for is to try and help you hone in your network and try and lock it down as much as possible. Next thing I'll talk about is the um, hosted VoIP. So as I mentioned, hosted VoIP is spectacular because our workforce, uh, we, we were able to send our, our staff home right away and not a single customer knows it. They, we transfer calls between people's houses, between their mobile phones, everything seamlessly. It's great, it works excellent. But what's a problem that we have is 911. It's a problem that everybody has with hosted VoIP. 911 is, is linked to a single address, and that address is probably not your home address. It's not your user's home address. That nine, it's probably linked to your business address. So what happens is if there's an emergency and somebody grabs that phone and dials 911, it's not going to have the right address. So a couple things. Number one, you can have your users first start by dialing 933. What 933 will actually read back what address is on file for that phone number that they call. So now you know what address is coming up. Number two, make sure you update the family that unless that phone has the right 911 address, don't use this phone to dial 911. Uh, do whatever you have to to make sure that if it's an emergency, they do not dial 911 with that phone. Um, and then ideally just put the phone away for safekeeping. We talked about um, uh, conference calls like this one uh, in Zoom. So Zoom has been great. It's, uh, I wish all of us were smart enough to buy this stock before this started, but what this has brought out is a lot of the security issues that are in Zoom. 
So um, there's a lot of uh, things that need to be locked down to have a Zoom. There's also updates. So Zoom even just did an update just for this meeting beforehand um, on the security updates. But essentially what we release is a, uh, we can give you a free best practices security for Zoom. Again, all you need to do is just fill a contact us page, just tell us uh, that you want it, we'll send it right off to you. And say, okay, this is, these, are, these are the typical steps that you wanna do to start locking down a, a Zoom meeting and making it as, uh, as um, mm -hmm. secure as, as you possibly can right now. All right, next thing is that our industry is very dynamic and on a regular basis, there are constantly updates. So that's why we have blogs. So our blogs were basically constantly updated with new, fresh, relevant topics that go over what's going on today, what, what things you need to look for, what security best practices. And we have lots of things uh, that were, when COVID hit, we had things right away saying, okay, listen, now that COVID's here, what do you need to do to, to start locking down your infrastructure to accommodate this new practice? Um, so I highly suggest that you go in, check on our blogs on a regular basis. They get updated a couple times a week with new articles. Um, that are all relevant to what's going on today and what's happening. All right. Next, let's hope this part comes soon, back to the office. So um, back to the office. So basically we have an infographic on steps to getting back to the office. Um, we will have a sign up page for this. It's just being finished right now. As you can see, this is the, the working copy. We're finishing up the rest of it right now. We're gonna have a sign up page for it reach out to us as soon as it's available. We'll give you the sign-up page, it'll be down. It's basically the 11 steps that you need to get ready to get back to the office and have your workforce ready again. Next thing that uh, we have, if, you, uh, if you're so interested, uh, for those of you on the financial side with the, that might apply for a PPP loan, we have a free uh, loan worksheet that we can give you that help you add in your expenses, see what, uh, what part of it is the forgiveness. So now that you've had the loan, now it's time to start working on the forgiveness part. We have a spreadsheet that'll help you track that. And you can send, um, send it to your financial uh, institute when the time comes. Again, just reach out to us on that same contact us page. We're more than happy to send it along. Okay, so I think um, what we talked about, so we talked about one, how things are working or should be working now. If they're not, call your IT provider or call us um, to get them set up the way they should be. We talked about the challenges and security problems and the solutions that are available for now. And then also what's next? What's coming down the road? What do we need to prepare for to get back to the office? One thing I want you guys to make sure you know of is that security is, is like gotta be pertinent to what's going on, especially now already. We already got everybody up and running. That was the first wave. Now let's make sure we have everybody secure and everybody's locked down and that everybody, that we're not getting ourselves in a vulnerable spot. Um, that's it. That's everything I have. Thank you very much. Uh, essentially, if, you, if anybody's interested, obviously you can uh, reach out to us. I'm more than happy to give any kind of consultation, free calls, free uh, talk to you. Just try and lock down if you have questions regarding the presentation, anything that you need clarified on or anything you might need help with, we're here. Thanks very much, Kenny, for a, it's a very informative webinar. Um, I just, I, I do actually have two questions for you. Um, sure. The first being, what kind of applications would you suggest? Because um, you mentioned that one person might be updating a file on their computer mm -hmm. and then another person at the same, so then they're not jiving. Sure, uh, I know yeah. some businesses are using, um, I think a Word document on Google, is that secure? Yeah, I mean, each one is gonna have their own layer of security. And what you're looking for is the enterprise level one. So Google Docs has an enterprise level version. Um, Microsoft has, uh, share file slash one drive uh sharepoint slash one drive sorry um it, um ignite is another product um that we have at a lot of ones uh that work really well um and so those all have uh hipaa components in them they all have um security in place that allow group policies and group working and folder revisions and restoration and then uh, my other one is you had on there for people to change their Wi-Fi encryption to make it stronger. How would they go about doing that? And then also, what's, how do you make it stronger? What is there like levels? Yeah, so there's uh, two different parts of Wi-Fi. Um, there's the actual 
um, encoding of the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, which would be the WPA and everything like that, most current Wi-Fi routers are going to have a fairly secure, secure one built into it. And older models might be easier to crack. Um, if it's in the actual business grade, we actually put a, a totally different level um, Wi-Fi router in there than what you'd find at home. It has a much more complex ability algorithm to it. Um, your typical home one is going to have a, a moderately complicated one built into it because you're not going to pay the to have those extra fees in it. Um, in order to change the password again on the enterprise level one, it's very easier for us to go in and we could change a password that affects the whole building, that all the Wi-Fi units are updated in any sync, so you can seamlessly walk through. At home, it's going to depend on where your Wi-Fi came from. Did it, is it a, like a Netgear unit that you bought from Best Buy, or is it built into the Verizon account or the Comcast account or something like that? So it's going to depend on where you got that from, and uh, that'll, that'll determine how you get in and change it. As far as password complexity, what you're looking for is a variation of uppercase, lowercase, random characters. And again, longer is better, but it doesn't mean that it longer has to be complex. Longer could be that, you know, a, a long Wi-Fi password could be simply like, I love the summer of 2020, and you change the I to an exclamation point and, you know, one of the zeros to an at sign done. You have a nice long password, but it's easy to remember because it's, it's an actual phrase. Um, so the, uh, in our industry, the moving towards the phrase passwords is the more preferred method because it's more, it's more um, protection. Good. Does anybody else have any other questions? Anything that they want to add? Any concerns? All right. Kenny, well, thank you again very much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end it, and then we'll be sharing this so that everybody who wasn't able to make it can uh, definitely benefit from this. It was loaded Shame with information. <laughs> well, there. Uh, who knows how long we're going to be, um, you know, in this situation. I know a lot of people are able to go back to work or, or might be able to go back to work next Monday, but that still doesn't alleviate the problem of childcare for the millions of people who have kids and they don't have access to childcare because those will still have um, restrictions. I know, uh, you know, other places and I'm sure even in here at some point they'll cancel all the, the summer camp. So you, working from home is going to be a long too. time. Mm -hmm. The dog daycare too. Just so. <laughs> Oh yeah. And those are the, those are the most boisterous I see, I hear. So, all right. Thank you, everybody, very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.